violence, sort of wheel of, uh, wheel of violence showing the stages of escalation. I don't know that that's as helpful as telling you my story, which is when I was being abused as an adult and into my partner violence, I, I knew it was coming. I could see it coming. I knew all the signs. And in fact, sometimes I would say to him, are you going to hit me now? And he would. So I think there are signs and you can see it escalating. I think the difficult part is the other side of that. The difficult part is we're talking about somebody that you're in love with. And so there's a trade-off because you know that the other side of the balance, there's great love. And it's a really confusing time. So you, you tend to put off calling the police yourself because you're looking for the love that you're seeking. And that makes it complicated. My advice is, in situations of intimate partner violence where you're the victim, get advice. Go to the experts, and I, I actually don't mean the police. I mean, go to, I, I, I don't mean that in any pejorative way about the police at all. I think the police do an incredible job under really hard circumstances. But find advice from people who've been through it. Go to Call Safe Horizons, and go, go to our website, and you'll find a, another uh, specialist cause that can help you. But, but you know, go and find a cause of people where people have been through it, because they know how to get away, and they can advise you on what happens next. I mean, I listened so many times to people saying, it's going to get worse. And I said, no, it wasn't. And then he knifed me, and I realized perhaps it had. So uh, my advice is um, to think about getting advice from people who aren't involved and people who aren't, uh, the police are involved. The minute you call the police, they're involved. They have to be. Reach out for, reach out for expertise. So one of the things you mentioned was that you know it's abuse if you feel like it's abuse. And I feel like maybe that's some of the cases, but not all of it. Because when I was first abused, I didn't, I didn't even have the vocabulary to know what was happening was wrong. Um, so, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but it may be helpful. Yeah, what's not illegal? You know legal abuse? No, what I'm saying is, yeah, there is abuse. So. I mean, I can show yeah. you yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, yes, okay, so I do, yes, I understand. <laughs> yes, yes. So one of the things that stood out about the play, like as they were listening to what was going on with the neighbor, was how they were talking to each other. Before it even escalated like 10 minutes into it, just from the get-go, he was saying, shut the F up, and she was like, leave me alone. I don't have people in my life that talk to me like that. Like, I don't know anybody who's ever told me to shut the fuck up, because they would not be in my life. And I think we've gotten used to those little things being okay, that we don't even recognize negativity when it's happening. Um, and so we're like, well, okay, if he hits me, that's abusive, but if he shakes me, that's okay. Uh, no. And so I think it can start from all those little things as well. And as far as like where to go to get help or to help others, um, I say Google. You can um, Google anything regarding um, abuse prevention networks or RAIN or stop abuse. There's so many organizations that are out there. You can look it up on Twitter or YouTube and you're gonna find people out there as well. Um, so you just have to like put in the little effort or if it's your neighbor that you have to go to or your friend or whatever. Um, but abuse can be anything. Like before he put his hand on her neck, he was already an asshole to me. So I was, for a period of time, uh, one of those people in the video, or in the, uh, the play. Um, regretfully, uh, for me, it was control, but it was what I learned. I saw my uncles doing it, smacking women, and you do what I say, and it was the um, Latin machismo, like, you know, I'm the man, and I, which I know is wrong now, but at the time, I didn't. And so, I say trust your gut. You know when you're in trouble. Your body will tell you. You need to kind of get in tune with your body to know when you're in these situations. For me, it was horrible um, to actually flash back, flash forward to that period of time. And it escalated. It was what was inside of me that was coming out. And the trigger, which was what was happening upstairs, easily provoked that anger um, and that rage to come out. Um, so again, trust your gut. And again, I, um, definitely online, there's uh, a lot of resources to stop abuse campaign. Um, 
six in one dialogue, there's a whole bunch of organizations uh, on this. If I may just add one thing, and that is, uh, I was amazed when I started speaking out about my own use and like wealth. I didn't actually have any memory of it at all until I was about 45. Um, and after I attempted suicide, a, a friend of mine came around for dinner. And I was in Atlanta. I didn't live in Atlanta. I borrowed some of his house to do the dirty deed. Um, and he said to me afterwards, you know, you should talk about this with your friends. And I thought, I can't talk about this with my friends. I can't talk about this with anybody. He said, no, you, you really, there are a lot of people in this world that care about you, Andrew. And I thought, no, there isn't, because otherwise I wouldn't have swallowed all those pills a couple of days ago. The thing I've found since is everybody cares. I haven't found anybody who didn't care. And the people who've, nobody's actually told me to shut up about my story. Some people yawned occasionally, but uh, nobody's ever told me to shut up. And so I would say if there are survivors here in the audience tonight who haven't talked, who haven't spoken, it's a really tough thing to do, but healing starts at that point. And so find the find her. So we're going to take about one or two more questions before we move into the next segment. Uh, sorry, don't let me turn away. So for me, it is um, being able to have found my own voice and now helping others to try to find their voice. And as Andrew um, so eloquently put it, that's where the healing begins. Um, and so I'm not that person that used to smack women. I'm not that crackhead that used to run the streets stealing from my family anymore. But yet I am a survivor. I was abused. And so I'm trying to see the silver lining in the things that have happened to me and try to kind of turn it around. And so we stand here as, as, again, a testimony of hope that there is hope for survivors. You have to get into some kind of therapy, some kind of community with other survivors. Speak and tell your story, and that will be the beginning uh, to the road. This is not a question as a survivor myself of um, incest, which is something that I just recently have been empowered to talk about because I choose to talk about military sexual assault, which is something that is more current. But I just wanted to let you know that, um, especially to the men, because I know it's harder, it seems as though it's harder for men to come out and speak on it. But I just want to let you know that all of y'all have empowered everyone in here because just recently I was at Times Square Church and for the first time I spoke about the incest in my family. And to the gentlemen, if you keep telling your story, someone will get locked up because I realize for my family, they don't stop. The demon in them don't, don't allow them to stop. So no matter how old it is, that they can get locked up because they don't stop. 
So I just want to applaud you all for doing it, and I am a survivor, and I am speaking out, and I just started a new organization that is dealing with sexual assault, especially military sexual assault. So thank you very much for being here. Next, we're going to be introducing to you guys.